The, sub the subcommittee will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the subcommittee at any time. And without objection, members of the full committee not on this subcommittee are authorized to participate in today's hearing. I'd like to welcome today's uh, witnesses. We will be doing, as we do on this committee, a hybrid uh, hearing. So members will be um, both physically present as well as piping in on the screen, which is visible to us uh, behind you, should be visible on either side. So we uh, beg your indulgence for any technical issues that that may uh, pose, but uh, we do anticipate a good, uh, a good dialogue, both um, in person and remotely today. Uh, this hearing is entitled Under the Radar, Alternative Payment Systems and the National Security Impacts of Their Growth. I now recognize myself for four minutes to give an opening statement. Payment systems are the lifeblood of the financial sector. They make sure that banks, businesses, and individuals around the globe can send and receive money without delay and keep the world's economies connected. The United States and the U.S. dollar in particular occupy a privileged role in the payment sector. As the world's primary reserve currency, our dollar is the most widely used in, a global trade, in global trade and cross-border payments. This gives U.S. authorities who are tasked with oversight immense capabilities to impose financial sanctions and isolate regimes who act against broadly shared international values. Earlier this year, we saw how U.S. dollars and the payment system can be leveraged to respond to bad behavior by our adversaries. After Russia invaded the sovereign nation of Ukraine, the United States and our allies acted swiftly to counter Putin's attack by limiting the Russian government's ability to obtain U.S. dollars and restricting Russian banks from accessing vital international financial messaging systems. As a result, the Russian economy began to erode and Putin and his cronies became international pariahs. The world was reminded how U.S. leadership and the U.S. dollar can tighten the screws on governments that violate long-standing norms. But the strengths and privileges of the dollar are far from uncontested. Around the globe, allies and adversaries alike are taking critical steps to de-dollarize their economies, to develop new methods to facilitate cross-border money transfers, and to control the plumbing of global finance. In some cases, these alternative payment systems are proactive measures taken by governments to mitigate the expected brunt of economic sanctions and international vilification. In other instances, these systems illustrate the ways that foreign regimes expand their influence in the global payment sector, weaken U.S. competitiveness, and jeopardize the era of dollar dominance. These systems each pose unique challenges that will require U.S. regulars and international community to refine our sanction strategies closely monitor worldwide financial trends and keep pace with the rapidly evolving payment ecosystem to make sure that we are not caught flat-footed. Our panel this morning will help us understand these challenges and how, highlight how Congress, how Congress, um, uh, how Congress and the administration can prepare for alternative payment systems to grow beyond our financial integrity capabilities and compromise our national security. In order for the U.S. to retain its status as a leader in the international payments arena, we must be ready to overcome the obstacles that await us, both in the near term and in the years ahead. Global leadership in the 21st century will be determined in part by the oversight and influence of the payment sector. Today, I look forward to learning how the United States can best preserve and maintain its status in the global payment system, defend against threats presented by alternative payment systems, and give policymakers and national security officials the right tools to defend our economy against the threats that lie ahead. With that, I'd like to welcome again our witnesses and thank them for helping us to shed light on this important topic. I now recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Barr, for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for yielding. And I join him in welcoming our panelists to this hearing. The rise of alternative payment systems abroad, particularly in China, has deepened Congress's interest in ensuring that our own payments infrastructure remains preeminent. Beijing's development of a digital RMB has also raised the specter of China removing itself and other countries from a dollar-based financial system with uncertain effects for our national security. I look forward to hearing our witnesses delve into these issues today, but let me offer some preliminary thoughts on how we can meet the rise of new payment technologies promoted by U.S. rivals. First, Congress must foster innovation in our own backyard so that dollar payments are quick, efficient, and secure. This means continually upgrading our payment capabilities, not resting on our laurels. Already, the Federal Reserve's Fedwire system processes nearly $4 trillion a day. 
with double-digit annual growth in the volume and value of its transfers. Next year's rollout of FedNow should further facilitate dollar payments for individuals and businesses. Committee Republicans have been pushing the Fed to prioritize cybersecurity in order to defend these critical functions. We have also underscored the importance of data privacy and cooperation with commercial banks as the Fed considers concepts for a central bank digital currency. If the world is to continue opting for the dollar, we must reject the Chinese model of using financial technology as a tool for government surveillance and control. We cannot and we should not compete with China by becoming more like China. The private sector is also key. While massive foreign players like Alipay and WeChat loom large, the United States and Europe have launched a diverse array of new payment services, from fintech startups to major technology companies. I'm confident that our commitment to competition, free enterprise, and the rule of law will point the way for global standards and payments, not the heavy hand of dictatorships like China. Second, it's essential for Washington to stop politicizing the institutions that have, have historically made our financial system the envy of the world. Whether it's the Federal Reserve, the Securities and Exchange Commission, banks, or Silicon Valley, we must resist the call of activists who want to mobilize them against anyone who doesn't share their beliefs, CESG. Just last week, for instance, we held a hearing on de-risking in the Caribbean where our committee was able to examine how law-abiding businesses in the region are being denied financial services like correspondent banking. This is a real problem. I, I only wish our majority would show a similar concern when their supporters demand that financial institutions pick and choose customers here at home based on environmental and social litmus tests. In the long term, infecting our financial system with political agendas of the day will only make other countries' payment services and currencies more attractive. Finally, the effectiveness of our sanctions and anti-money laundering regime rests on the dominance of the dollar. As long as this is the case, foreign countries' attempts to evade U.S. law enforcement will be limited. Just ask the Russian central bank or cryptocurrency exchanges abroad that have been targeted by OFAC. The dollar is king because its value is market determined, because we support free capital flows, because our legal system protects investors rather than preying on them. Dollars give you a claim to countless high-quality goods and services produced by a, tr a $25 trillion economy. Ultimately, it is economic dynamism and our responsible stewardship of the financial system that will stymie our adversaries' efforts to escape the dollar's reach as long as we don't stray off course. China, for its part, is running out of feet to shoot. Its zero COVID policy is producing urban dystopias throughout the, th that country. Its real estate sector is teetering, and Beijing has shackled itself to Moscow while the West stands united behind Ukraine. These aren't the moves of a regime that deserves greater sway over the, the, over the world's financial architecture. And that is a bipartisan sentiment, fortunately. While China is, get, is betting on its financial governance as the wave of the future, global markets have been betting on ours. We must do everything we can't keep it that way. I look forward to our witnesses' testimony, and I yield back. I thank the ranking member and now recognize the chairwoman of the full committee, the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Waters, for one minute. Thank you very much, Chairman Himes, for convening this hearing on the current and future national security challenges related to the growth of alternative payment systems. These systems can drive inclusion and offer convenience, but because they are generally outside of the Western federal financial system, they also offer opportunities for sanctions, evasion, and other financial crime. Further, they rival U.S. dollar-led trade and payments systems, potentially undermining the strength of the dollar and our ability to leverage tools like economic and trade sanctions. So I look forward to hearing from today's witnesses on what Congress needs to do uh, to consider regarding this growing concern. I yield back. I thank the chairwoman of the full committee and turn now to our witnesses. Uh, today we welcome the testimony of our distinguished witnesses. First, we have Emily Jin, the research assistant for the Energy Economics and Security Program at the Center for a New American Security, 
Then we will hear from Scott DeWicke, who is Global Fellow for Science and Technology Innovation at the Wilson Center. Next, we'll have Dr. Carla Norloff, a non-resident senior fellow for the Economic Statecraft Initiatives Geoeconomic Center at the Atlantic Council. Next, we will have Ari Redboard, who is the head of legal and government affairs at TRM Labs. And finally, we will hear from Jonathan Levin, who is the co-founder and chief strategy officer at Chainalysis. Witnesses are reminded that their oral testimony will be limited to five minutes. You should be able to see a timer that will indicate how much time you have left. I would ask that you be mindful of the timer so that we can be respectful of both the other witnesses and committee members' time. Without objection, your written statement will be made part of the record. Ms. Jin, you are now recognized for five minutes for a presentation of your testimony. Chairwoman Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, Subcommittee Chairman Himes, Subcommittee Ranking Member Barr, and the distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today and for your interest in the important policy area of payment systems and national security. It is an honor to share the panel with my fellow witnesses. I study China's alternative payments systems and rails, principally the cross-border interbank payment systems, or SIPs, and the digital RMB, or ECNY, in the context of great power competition between the United States and China. My testimony addresses China's progress in building out these two alternative payment systems, the implications of growth in these payment systems, and recommends a policy posture to prepare America for a future where alternative payment systems are more prominent than they are today. First, on SIPs. We should understand what SIPs is and what it's not. It's an RMB clearing and settlement mechanism that facilitates cross-border RMB transactions. It is not China's version of SWIFT yet, as it does not provide messaging services broadly to global financial institutions. Second, on the digital RMB. The digital RMB, or the ECNY, is the digital version of the Chinese national currency, the RMB. It is a national payment structure that is mostly domestic and retail, which has been implemented across all levels of Chinese society. It, however, increasingly has the potential cross-border applications and implications. At their current stages, these two alternative payment systems are not threats to the mainstream financial system. However, they are growing in technical sophistication and domestic adoption. SIP's use is on an upward trajectory and digital RMB pilot projects are penetrating through all levels of Chinese society. Under an ambitious Chinese leadership that envisions more prominent roles for Chinese institutions in international finance, these systems could gain traction internationally and scale up accordingly with the right geopolitical conditions over the long run. In such a scenario, Chinese alternative payment systems and coalitions of alternative payment systems could eventually erode the ability of the United States to use financial sanctions as a deterrent or punishment in the event of a Taiwan crisis or other geopolitical scenarios. Moreover, these payment systems could challenge the institutions under the current financial order. The United States, as a leader in the global financial order, needs to respond to this long-term risk today. The United States cannot control the way other countries are developing their systems. The United States can, however, craft sound policy to influence the march of global payments innovation and maintain U.S. leadership in the international financial system. Out of my list of recommendations, I will highlight three. First, the United States government should support institutions that conduct research on America's and China's financial statecraft. The Department of the Treasury, the Federal Reserve Board of Governors, and the Federal Reserve Banks should designate units of analysts to conduct annual assessments of currency flows in the global payment systems. These analytical units should monitor the use, growth, and connectivity of these alternative payment systems. Second, Congress should consider mandating the drafting of a long-term strategy document, updated every two to four years, to signal the direction of US financial statecraft and the United States thinking for the future of the dollar. This will not only instill confidence in the American private sector that US dollar preeminence is a priority, it would also provide clarity to our allies and partners on the United States financial statecraft posture. Third, the Treasury Department should develop policy measures to prevent sanctioned entities from taking advantage of alternative payment systems. There should be predetermined policy triggers. If there is proof that Chinese financial institutions cleared and settled transactions with sanctioned individuals or organizations through SIPs, 
the Treasury's Office of Foreign Assets Control should consider financial sanctions or secondary sanctions on financial institutions that facilitated these transactions. The Department of the Treasury should study the impact of such sanctions prior to levying such tools, given the high likelihood of knock-on effects from such actions. In summary, I recommend a policy posture that is informed, anticipatory, but not overly alarmist. After asking the question on how alternative payment systems are developing, the United States should focus on how it can maintain leadership in international finance and continue to exert influence in the global financial economic system to serve American national interests. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Ms. Jin. Mr. DeWicki, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, esteemed members of the House Financial Services Committee, uh, Chairman Himes, uh, Ranking Member uh, uh, McHenry, Chairman, Chairwoman Waters, and Ranking Member Barr. Um, I'd like to thank the committee for inviting me to testify on this often ignored era, area of the modern financial world. <clears throat> I'd like to briefly describe the outlines of the risks presented by the use of virtual currencies to the United States and its allies in the Western world. Please also refer to my written testimony for greater detail regarding my thoughts on the great advantages of many, but not all, of these systems to the billions of unbanked and underbanked people around the world. It's not all bad. The scope of virtual currencies extends far beyond Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies and includes many alternative payment systems you are familiar with, such as PayPal or Western Union, but also included are hundreds more that you might not be familiar with. Some of these, such as Russia's dark PayPals, I call them, including web money and perfect money, have often been used by criminals, especially Russian criminals. Uh, Kiwi, as I previously testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee, was used to purchase Facebook ads attempting to influence the 2016 US presidential election. The nexus between adversarial, illiberal regimes and cybercrime cartels acting as their proxies using these systems is clear. These alternative payment systems are not small, with China's centralized virtual currencies, WeChat Pay and Alipay, processing 294.6 trillion won, or about $45.6 trillion in 2020. This dwarfs the $15.8 trillion in all crypto-related transactions that MasterCard CypherTrace estimated occurred in 2021. While public blockchain intelligence systems uh, like Chainalysis, TRM, and CypherTrace are beginning to do peel chain analysis where cryptocurrencies are exchanged for others to obfuscate their origins or usage. They do poorly when assessing where the money goes after conversion into a privacy coin, a centralized virtual currency like Alipay, or other alternative payment systems. Traditional follow the money approaches often miss the role played by uh, the alternative payments ecosystem, I'll call it the APE for short, uh, especially when executed without a generalized understanding of the varied and constantly morphing set of companies and services that are part of it. Focusing only on cryptocurrency risks, misunderstanding this goal, uh, this global thriving ecosystem. Uh, combined, these virtual currencies, mobile payment systems, remittance systems, and stored value card systems fuel the shadow economy, as well as enabling very positive changes for the world's unbanked and underbanked. I define this as an ecosystem because they are all connected through hundreds of virtual currency exchanges, converting one alternative payment system for another and another, or to and from fiat. Anonymity or misattribution, misattribution lives there, uh, where know your customer KYC practices are being poorly applied or ignored entirely, especially outside of the West. Financial open source intelligence, um, FOCENT, should be developed as a discipline as well as building tools to understand and monitor this ecosystem as a whole. The very stability of the global financial ecosystem, at least as we are familiar with it today, is being threatened as this ape has exploded in popularity and viability, becoming woven into the global social fabric. It provides a growing and capable set of interconnected, non-bank financial channels that may or may not ever touch the traditional financial system. The internet has connected them just as SWIFT and ACH messaging networks provided the original connectivity for banks and other financial institutions to build our current payment system. These traditional bank-centric financial systems are under siege as the ground beneath them shifts amid the awakening of the unbanked and underbanked as well as the burgeoning global middle class. Frequent use of financial sanctions has contributed to this shift as Chinese and Russian new payment systems bypass SWIFT and other Western-dominated financial backbones. 
no longer the domain of fintech startups, nor just limited to cryptocurrencies, nation states are playing the great game on this new terrain. Increasingly, the high ground of that terrain will be central bank digital currencies. Nine countries have launched CBDCs, another 15 are in pilot and 16 in development. The United States is not one of them, although President Biden's recent executive order on digital assets is a positive statement of intention to enter that arena. Currently, the United States is able to monitor and regulate most global payment flows of dollars, but CBDCs and other new payment systems are already limiting our ability to track cross-border money flows. In the long term, the absence of US leadership and standard setting will have, a ge will have geopolitical consequences, especially if China maintains its first mover advantage in the development of CBDCs. If China alone or with other BRIC countries is able to combine their non-crypto virtual currencies with a viable CBDC, then soon there will be a real financial and national security problem beyond your ability to regulate. Um, if that day comes, and it could be sooner than most think, the West's ability to dominate the world's financial sphere of soft power will lessen. Without action, our ability to live in a rules-based financial system will fade with it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dewicki. Dr. Nurloff, you are now recognized for five minutes. Dear committee members, thank you, Chairman Waters and Ranking Mem Member McHenry, and also Subcommittee Chairman Himes and Ranking Member Barr for inviting me to testify on this important topic. I am deeply honored. My testimony is based on an upcoming report written for the Frankfurt Forum organized by the Atlantic Council's Geoeconomics Center and Atlantic Brugge. Alternative payment systems pose national security risks because they could undercut the dominant role of the dollar in the international currency system. The dollar is by far the most frequently and widely used currency by both governments and private actors. It is uh, used across all currency functions and it is the only currency that is truly global. There's no immediate or even medium term threat to the dollar's dominance. Even over the long term, it is likely to stay dominant in absolute terms. Other payment systems could, however, threaten the dollar's relative dominance, and we are already seeing a relative decline in the dollar's status. For at least two decades, the international currency system has been strictly unipolar, but after 2017, the system became less unipolar and in some years came very close to becoming a bipolar or multipolar system. Even if relative decline towards other currency majors persists, an end to the dollar's uh, absolute dominance is nowhere in sight, but relative decline could become an issue. Sanctions are likely motivating some countries to diversify away from the dollar and to devise alternative payment systems to avoid use of the dollar as storing assets in countries where they can be seized. As a countervailing tendency, however, countries joining U.S. sanctions efforts, as well as countries supporting sanction objectives short of imposing sanctions themselves, continue to have geopolitical incentives to diversify into the currencies by the sanctioning coalition, including dollars. Preliminary analysis of diversification out of Western currencies following the sanctions on Russia in February 2022 suggests very modest diversification out of dollars. Um, some diversification out of pound and yen as well, and diversification into Chinese RMB, other currencies, and euros. If alternative payment systems expand to involve many countries and private users and cover a wide array of commercial and financial transactions, the dollar will inevitably play a less prominent role than it has in the past, and this is a scenario worth considering. With the decline in the dollar's importance in the international economy, the economic and geopolitical benefits the United States enjoys as a result of issuing the dominant uh, currency will also decline. An acute weakening of the dollar's global role will jeopardize the United States' ability to influence, stabilize, and enforce international order. The national security ramifications could be quite significant. 
Whenever possible, the United States should therefore work with allies to gain support for major sanction initiatives, as in the case of the recent sanctions against Russia. To mitigate the growth in alternative payments, the United States should avoid sanctions considered to be unfair or overly harsh. The United States should exhaust softer diplomatic influence attempts before reaching for sanctions, even when maximum campaigns, such as blocking a central bank's uh, reserves, is not being considered. By signaling a commitment to dialogue and cooperative solutions in the overall use of sanctions, undecided nations are more likely to remain within the familiar liquid dollar system than to sign up to uncertain, less liquid alternative payment systems. Lastly, the United States cannot afford to simultaneously adopt a hard line towards foes and allies. The sharpest decline in the polarity of the international currency system coincides with an uptick in sanctions at a time when President Trump adopted a tough stance against allies, making them insecure about US security commitments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Norloff. Mr. Redboard, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, Subcommittee Chairman Himes, Ranking Member Barr, and members of the committee for holding this hearing and inviting me to participate. I am humbled by the critical role this institution plays in protecting our democracy. My name is Ari Redboard. I am head of legal and government affairs at TRM Labs, the blockchain intelligence company. What is blockchain intelligence? At TRM, we analyze public data from 25 blockchains and from over a million different digital assets. We then combine that publicly available data with advanced analytics and proprietary threat intelligence to provide unique insights on fraud, financial crime, and national security risks to cryptocurrency businesses, financial institutions, law enforcement, and regulatory agencies worldwide. I hope that through my written and oral testimony today, the subcommittee can benefit from some of those unique insights. I've spent my career working to protect the financial system from illicit actors. First, for over a decade as a federal prosecutor at the US Attorney's Office for the District of Columbia, and then at the Treasury Department as a senior advisor to the Undersecretary for Terrorism and Financial Intelligence. During my time at Treasury, every morning I walked past the Secretary's Office where there was a painting of Alexander Hamilton. That painting reminded me of what we were there to protect, a complex financial system filled with both challenges and opportunities. Today, our financial system faces new and emerging challenges, but it is also filled with opportunity. Both adversaries and allies alike are exploring alternative <laughs> payment systems that may circumvent the US financial system, impacting the primacy of the US dollar, the efficacy of US sanctions, and the ability for the US to monitor financial crime. However, as non-democratic regimes attempt to build alternative payment rails through centralized government brute force, there is an alternative. We can enable the free market to innovate faster on solutions that incorporate democratic principles. One place this is happening today is with blockchain technology. We are already seeing blockchain technology lead to more competitive markets, grow the economy, and advance national security. For instance, financial services such as stablecoins enable consumers to seamlessly send money between companies across the globe. This could spur financial inclusion, lead to more competitive markets, and give consumers lower prices and greater choice. And according to TRM's analysis, 99% of fiat-backed stablecoin value is tied to the US dollar. Supporting the growth of dollar-backed stablecoins operated by regulated US entities by establishing rules that ensure stability, security, and interoperability can help protect dollar primacy, ensure the efficacy of sanctions, and spread democratic principles across the world. The native properties of public blockchains, data that is transparent, traceable, public, permanent, private and programmable can enable law enforcement and regulators to more readily identify risks and more effectively and efficiently detect and investigate financial crime. The nature of public blockchains even facilitates the implementation of effective sanctions. For example, after North Korea's March 2022 hack of the Ronin Bridge, where cyber criminals stole over 600 million in cryptocurrency, OFACT used blockchain intelligence to quickly trace the stolen funds. 
OFAC then sanctioned both the blockchain addresses to which the funds moved and the mixing services that North Korean cyber criminals had utilized to launder over a billion dollars of cryptocurrency. These rapid sanctions designations were possible only because of the transparent nature of public blockchains. According to TRM analysis, total monthly deposits into one of those mixers, Tornado Cash, decreased by 68% in the month after it was sanctioned. The strength of U.S. sanctions comes not from the primacy of the U.S. dollar alone, but also from the fact that the U.S. is home to innovative companies and people who are transacting in a global economy. The key to effective U.S. sanctions is to ensure that businesses that are leading in the new digital economy remain in the U.S. and serve U.S. customers. Just as the most significant companies of the Internet age were born in the United States, the U.S. can be home to leaders of this new economy. As the White House wrote in the Framework for Digital Assets published last week, U.S. companies lead the world in innovation. Digital asset firms are no exception. This should be a clarion call to a race to create and serve businesses in this new economy. Every morning when I walk by that painting of Alexander Hamilton, I reflected on a quote from Lin-Manuel Miranda's musical, what is a legacy? It is building seeds in a garden you never get to see. This is our legacy, our opportunity to plant the seeds to ensure that democratic principles thrive in a growing financial system. Thank you, and I look forward to answering your questions today. Thank you, Mr. Redboard. Mr. Levin, you're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Chairman, Chairwoman Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, Chairman Himes, Ranking Member Barr, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for inviting me here today to testify in front of you. My name is Jonathan Levin, and I'm one of the co-founders of Chainalysis. Chainalysis is the world leader in cryptocurrency investigative and compliance solutions. Before Chainalysis, 15 years ago, I spent a summer in Shanghai. And at that time, the Chinese financial payment system was broken. I couldn't withdraw cash at the same bank when I went on a trip to, Berlin, to Beijing. Um, in the past 15 years, however, China has made enormous progress when it comes to financial innovation and mobile payments. They are now looking to export their domestic systems internationally through the domestic companies and through their foreign investments in other financial technology firms and further innovation with the CBDC, as previously mentioned on, on this witness testimony. We must, we must have a response. Do we need a response to that? Or? Um, I, have, I have spent the last decade building chain analysis and sitting on many task forces to actually improve our domestic payment system. All of this has been targeted at our domestic payment system and not at international competition. Cryptocurrencies actually mark the first innovation that is consistent with US values and posing a real competitive threat to China's financial innovation strategy and their bid to own the financial rails for the 21st century. China cannot have a financial payment system that prioritizes strong guarantees over property rights and financial privacy. We must therefore mitigate the national security risks that arise from cryptocurrencies to unlock their strategic potential. Chainalysis's tools are used by government agencies around the world to investigate the illicit use of cryptocurrencies. And I want to highlight that the transparency of cryptocurrencies enhances the government's ability to detect, attribute, and ultimately disrupt the illicit use of cryptocurrencies. In many instances, it is actually, in fact, easier to investigate cases involving the illicit use of cryptocurrencies than other traditional means of payment or some of the alternative payment systems that we're talking about. And furthermore, the percentage of illicit activity in cryptocurrencies is well below the three to 5% estimates globally of money laundering in our financial system. That being said, because of the transparent nature of cryptocurrencies, there are many stories about illicit activity and funds being identified and actually being recovered. Recently, we were proud that in the Ronin Bridge hack that, that Ari just mentioned, we were proud that our tools could assist DOJ in actually recovering $30 million worth of cryptocurrency stolen by North Korean linked hackers 
which I know is something of great importance and meaning to this committee. There are many more success stories of how the government has been able to leverage this technology to disrupt illicit activity, starting back at cases that I testified in front of this committee about um, a few years ago, including the Mt. Gox hack. In my written testimony, I discuss global trends in cryptocurrency, provide the background on chain analysis, and how blockchain analysis can be leveraged in investigations. We also delve into the national security threats that are key to this committee and understanding the risks posed by these systems, including its abuse by actors in Iran, North Korea, Russia, and China, and provide recommendations for improving our response to this threat. In the 20th century, the United States built the most mature financial system in the world. The guardrails were established to foster innovation and capital formation, where individuals and corporations have clear knowledge of property rights, counterparty risks, and the costs of transacting. The US regulation around commerce on the internet gave rise to the largest corporations in the world. Cryptocurrencies and stablecoins are already providing these services to consumers and businesses. In fact, we released our global adoption index this week at Chainalysis, highlighting that Vietnam, Philippines, and Ukraine are among the top adopting countries in the world. We can ensure that our payment rails are used around the world and that it's built by US companies to serve US principles. I look forward to your questions during this testimony. Thank you, Mr. Levin. I now recognize myself for five minutes of questions and, and, and begin really with one question that has a strategic philosophical part and then a, a, a request for kind of policy recommendations. My, my, my question is this. Um, there's an understandable instinct here um, to really go hard after the Chinese for their behavior in Hong Kong and Taiwan and Xinjiang and their stealing of our intellectual power, all the long bill of indictment. Um, and it's an understandable instinct, but it concerns me because unlike the situation with Russia, where we do negligible trade and have negligible economic ties, the situation with China could not be more different. Uh, they hold $1 trillion of US sovereign debt. They do $2.5 trillion of global trade annually, 600 billion or so of that with the United States. If we took the approach with China that we've taken with Russia, the devastation to our economy and the global economy would be remarkable. Therefore, I'm concerned about proposals to isolate them, to shut them down from the capital markets, some of the proposals around here. So my philosophical question is, how should we think ab about strategically, how should we think about countering China in a way that doesn't bring economic apocalypse to us and to the globe? Um, and then, then my more, much more specific policy question is, if the, whatever, the, whatever your answer might be, what specific things should we be doing with respect to uh, platforms like Alipay and, uh, and SIPs? Should it be shut it down? Should it be demand accountability? So again, I'd love to, I'm, I'm not, I'll let whoever wants to take the jump ball, but, but help me with both that strategic and those specific questions. Happy to take the the jump ball, um, although the analogy is a little bit lost on me, but I think I get it. Um, the, uh, I think it's a great question. Let me answer the first part first. So I think that when it comes to global competition, there is a big difference between Russia and China. We need to think a lot about what, what I call asymmetric defense. The, the symmetric defense that we have against Russia is the exclusion of them from the financial system. When it comes to China, we have to play a more long-term game. And what I mean by that is that we, we have a technology race on, on things like chips, AI, et cetera, where we need to build things that are the most advanced in the world, but that can be easily co-opted and suit the regime in China. What, what I think is interesting when it comes to payments is that actually our values on financial systems are completely different to that what exists in China. And therefore, if we can actually foster a place where there are strong property rights, where people's financial privacy is actually guaranteed um, you know, with regulation and oversight, we can actually have a financial system for the world that mirrors American values rather than the Chinese. And so I think that it's one of these domains where we can actually you know, try and foster a world of um, you know, financial innovation, which actually goes diametrically opposed to the values that the Chinese party has. So Mr. Levin, what I'm getting from you is the, the strategic answer is build a better mousetrap. Don't worry quite so much about shutting down their product. Just build a much better product. Uh, Mr. Dewicki, I saw you raising your hand. 
I totally agree with everything uh, Mr. Levin just said. Uh, in addition, uh, emphasizing that the technology, the capabilities to build out on, especially blockchain-based solutions, the ECNY is a distributed ledger system. It's not truly the, the type of blockchain system that we think of because the Chinese don't want the auditability, the transparency, um, the ability to uh, um, you know, provide things like, like property rights that are uh, uh, not challengeable. What the Chinese want uh, is the ability to collect information on people and to consolidate that information for their own purposes. So by uh, basically unchaining the ability of our industry to go ahead and compete along with much better cybersecurity so that we're not giving up these uh, secrets that we're working on, that's very important. Um, secondly, from uh, the, all the other alternative payment systems, um, you know, we just need to make sure that um, the Chinese aren't able to expand into areas where they can benefit from you know, having geolocation uh, baked into their systems for all the users. Um, certainly that's something they've tried to do in Europe. We have tried, we've successfully kept them out of the US. Uh, and where there are uh, problems with money laundering, threat finance, et cetera, uh, respond to them uh, and to those systems specifically the way. So I, 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 well, let, me, let, me, let me stop you, Mr. Dewey. So I've got two witnesses now saying really the path here is to build out a system consistent with our values that will be attractive. Is there a dissenting voice or anything added? I've only got about 10 seconds, so. Mr. Ives, this is certainly not a, not a dissent, but I would say sort of, look, there, 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 is, there, there is important work to be done on the pressure side as well. Uh, the Permanent Summit Committee on Investigations has some great, um, particularly in the intellectual property uh, theft space. That said, really sort of the key to winning here is certainly what we're hearing from Mr. Levin, um, Mr. Dewicki, and that is, you know, building a better mousetrap. Look, we're seeing this in the blockchain space today, where China has essentially built uh, blockchain infrastructure that is that doesn't have the democratic values baked in that is intended for surveillance and, and state espionage. And, that, and thank you. I, I, I'm sorry. We'll, we'll hopefully have a chance to continue the conversation, but I need to be a little bit disciplined on time. So that's it for me. And I now recognize the ranking member for five minutes of questions. Mr. Chairman, thank you for convening such an important and interesting hearing, uh, a timely hearing. Uh, let me uh, start with a kind of a threshold question. There are two narratives about the advent of digital assets and cryptocurrencies in uh, law enforcement and sanctions evasion. One is that the pseudonymity of digital assets and cryptocurrencies enable, facilitate criminal activity, enable money laundering. It's, it, it helps uh, ransomware. It's, it's uh, assisting of, of sanctions evasion and cyber attacks and, and the like. There's another narrative, Mr. Redford and Mr. Levin, that your firms are able to use blockchain technology to assist law enforcement to crack down on these types of illicit activities. Which narrative is right? Is it a little bit of a combination? Um, speak to that for us. Yeah, um, thank, you, thank you for the question. Look, I, I, think, you, I think you nailed it. The, the same qualities that make blockchain such a force for good, permissionless, decentralized, cross-border value transfer at the speed of the internet, also make it attractive to illicit actors who want to fund, move funds quickly cross-border. But the reality is we've never had more visibility on financial flows than we've ever had before. You know, when I was a prosecutor, I worked these cases, and now with TRM, we assist law enforcement in investigating fraud and financial crime. And they can trace the flow of funds in ways that you never could with bulk cash smuggling and networks of hawalas and shell companies. And I think the reality is we're seeing that play out. You know, for example, uh, there was a recent arrest in a, in a case uh, involving a 2016 hack of the, the cryptocurrency exchange Bitfinex. Well, that was a 2016 hack. But because of the nature of blockchains, this immutable public ledger that is forever, law enforcement was able to go back and use tools to trace and track the flow of funds in ways you never would be able to in the traditional financial system. So there's certainly, obviously, you know, there's, there are certainly ways to sort of move funds in crypto, um, but there's also more visibility on those financial flows than ever before. Mr. Levin. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you, sir, for the question. I think that one thing I would say is that to make the, the second nar narrative work is we have to change our mindset. That we have never had a financial system that is as open as cryptocurrencies and presents the types of opportunities to monitor for illicit activity. And it has to start with a change in mindset for our executive branch of how they can actually 
proactively go after the types of threats that exist. And so what we have demonstrated over the last eight years is that it is definitely possible with this technology to go after criminals and to find them and to take sanctions actions and seizures and, and really hold people to account. But actually, you know, as this system proliferates, we need to get proactive with our type of monitoring of the types of threats that exist. And we need to charge our executive branch with, you know, how do you do that proactively in an age where this information is out there online? And how do you take a technology-first approach to dealing with these problems in a way that modernizes the type of approach to financial intelligence that we've seen in the past? Uh, let, let me shift gears to uh, central bank digital currency. Uh, for a minute. Um, what is the better approach to preserving and protecting and maintaining the dollar's dominance? Is it a Fed uh, digital currency, a Fed-issued digital currency, a, CD, uh, a central bank digital currency in the United States to compete with the digital RMB? Or is it a regulatory framework for fiat-backed stable coins to uh, preserve the utilization of the dollar as the world's currency, um, uh, harnessing private sector innovation to advance a, U a U.S.-centric version of frictionless, cross-border, um, um, secure um, uh, use of, of, of digital currency backed by the dollar. Which is the better approach and why? I'll, I'll take it. A quick crack at it. Look, I, I think what's what's interesting about the question is certainly what we hear from the executive branch is there's continued work in the CBDC space. Even as late as last week, we heard from the White House in a very detailed technological discussion that they're still working on 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 a CBDC. And the, the the jury's really still out on whether that will happen at all. But the reality is that stable coins are proliferating today globally. And you know, as I said in the, in the in the statement, 99% uh, of those. Are, are, uh, uh, that are backed by fiat currencies are backed by the U.S. dollar, which gives us an incredible opportunity to export our values and our principles abroad through private technology of that kind. And I think we have a real, this is a really extraordinary moment when we see that level of commerce happening in U.S. dollars in the digital space, that this is really, a, it's, it's a moment to really provide le legislative legal clarity to that space today as we still work on figuring out whether or not a CBDC makes sense. My time has expired, but I think it speaks to competing with China, not by becoming more like China, but, but by doing this the American way. Well said. Gentlemen, time has expired. The chairwoman of the full committee, Ms. Waters, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you so very much. I am so pleased for this hearing uh, and the witnesses that are here testifying today uh, because uh, we have gained substantial information already and uh, the questions that are being raised uh, by our members here will help us in so many ways as we move forward. As you know, we are focused on stable coins right now, and we are developing uh, legislation um, because of uh, you know the uh, volatility, uh, because of the fact that we discovered uh, that the representation for uh, assets uh, that were being held by some of these companies was uh, really not real. Uh, it was less than, a lot less than what they said. And so I, I really want to know um, uh, for uh, Mr. Redboard, with what Mr. Duwoki has said, has described, can you please address the need for the U.S. to develop a legal and regulatory framework to deal with stable coins? the market for which is already over $152 billion. Can we afford to do nothing or delay further federal action, especially on ensuring that anti-money laundering and sanctions protections are included in this alternative payments methods growth? Chairwoman Waters, thank you for the question. Um, look, on, the, on one hand, it is critical to ensure that regulation in an emerging space like this is done right. You want to ensure the open process that you've been engaging in uh, and the opportunities for stakeholders to engage. But on the other hand, the time is now. You know, in the wake of, of the collapse of Terra, an algorithmic stablecoin, we've seen policymakers and regulators globally um, move to provide frameworks for stablecoins. We've seen safety nets um, you know, th th through, through regulation. Um, and it's really a moment to assert US leadership by establishing rules that ensure the stability, security, and interoperability of regulated stablecoins. 
In any discussion, it's critical to point out that Terra was very, very different from, from what we're talking about today, these US-backed stable coins that will allow us to really um, to, to, to transact globally in, in US dollars or US-backed um, stable coins. But as, as we continue to study the CBDC, the time really is now to act to provide clear regulatory guidance or clear legislative guidance to stablecoin issuers, particularly in this US-backed space, to really give us the opportunity to lead here. Um, so, 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 so the time is really now in this space. Thank you very much. And since uh, you talked about blockchain uh, quite a bit in responding, I think, to one of our members, what role, what significant role can blockchain play in the identification of uh, alternative payment systems that may not be in the best interest of uh, the U.S. or, or internationally? A absolutely. Um, look, I, I think that sort of as we as we discussed a little bit earlier, you know, blockchains allow for unprecedented uh, visibility on financial flows, and it allows us to identify not just illicit finance and bad actors, but also um, instances that that affect market integrity. And it is crit and, and what blockchains really allow with that permanent, immutable public ledger is allows us to track trends in in, in ways we never could before. You know, that even in preparing for this hearing. We have a blockchain intelligence team at TRM, and they, they, they continuously provided updates to me on, on key insights on data. And this, is, this is, would be impossible without the extraordinary power of open blockchains. We have more insights on financial flows, not just financial crime, than we ever had before. And we just need to ensure as we're building blockchain frameworks, just like they're building blockchain frameworks in, in China, that we're baking uh, U.S. principles and, and democratic principles into that process. Well, I want to thank you all for your testimony today. This is so important, not only as um, I have described, um, our first major legislation uh, is dealing with stable coins, and uh, we know a lot about what has happened uh, with stable coins up to this point. But we're moving, as you know, to consider where we're we going to stand with CDBC. And um, so everything that we can understand and learn about how to deal with um, alternative payments, I think is going to be very important. And while I share our, um, our subcommittee chair's concerns about China, you must know uh, that many of us are looking very closely at China for everything and trying to make sure uh, that their cooperation with Russia or North Korea is not such that they're gaining ground on us uh, in any aspect of our economy and our um, democracy. So thank you so very much for being here today. Gentlelady's time has expired. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Sessions, is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much, and my thanks to you and the gentlewoman, uh, Ms. Waters, the chairman of the committee, for holding this, what is an insightful and timely, uh, opportunity to hear from our witnesses. And let me congratulate each of you. I think you've given us not only good insight, uh, but uh, fair warning of what lies ahead. Um, I want to go back to, because I think my thinking is a lot like our ranking member, the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Barr. And I've changed four or five times in my thinking since then, as each of you have spoken. I only have a few minutes, but let me say this. I've got a question, and that question revolves around if the United States, as we migrate to this stable coin and we finish the, the legislation that the gentlewoman has and we move forward, two questions. Number one, can we see, other than knowing what China is after, that they are after more data information of personal people, which here in the United States, we don't want to do that, personal information and data that could be used to control anybody. And secondly, about the excessive amount of money that was stolen by gangs uh, as we provided our COVID relief and other things that goes into the billions of dollars. How stable and secure are these processes and do you have any feedback on that? I guess I would ask, Mr. Levin, if, if you have an idea, Mr. Redboard, uh, or, or Mr. I'm going to say it wrong, Dweek? 
because in particular, I think I focused on specific areas that you've addressed that. So if you would take the remaining three minutes and 10 seconds, perhaps, perhaps a minute each, and uh, provide me some context. Um, and it's a great question because it gets to, uh, especially for the, um, the COVID relief, it, it gets to the very porous natures of a lot of these processes where you don't have good control. And the underlying technology of cryptocurrency, uh, including Bitcoin, is, of course, the blockchain. And people often conflate blockchain with strictly financial applications. But in fact, uh, I done a lot of work with uh, the healthcare industry where the blockchain um, was being used, at least in pilot form, to, uh, to um, share identity and to um, avoid the leaking of personally identifiable information. Um, it certainly would lend itself well to a process uh, like an aid process where you're trying to get money out there, but you need to understand who, who it's going to. Now, it's not something you're gonna be able to set up immediately in a crisis. But if you had such a system prepared, certainly blockchain would help do that. Um, secondly, uh, as far as stable coins, stable coins in general, the um, I think what people are, are sometimes missing when they focus on it. I, I agree that it's it's a way to focus innovation, focus the American way to, to building new um, uh, systems like that. Um, but don't forget it's part of an ecosystem, and don't forget that it is fungible. And um, you know, without having controls on that from stem to stern, you're going to lose control quite often. And um, even with the stable coins that are out there today, you oftentimes will see it be converted you know, out of uh, that stable coin and into something else that isn't trackable. It might be a privacy coin, might be one of these centralized virtual currencies based in Russia, and then come back in, and you're not gonna be able to track that. So, Better know your customer requirements, I think, are part of this too. We do this first layer of KYC pretty well for who's gonna be part of your, uh, your, your customer. Who they're dealing with does not go as well. And in fact, there are person-to-person uh, -person, um, exchanges, even in the United States, where there are publicly posted um, requests to buy or sell cryptocurrency, and they say that they don't need to have identity of that person. So even meeting the, the requirements of the current regulations and laws as they exist, it's still, they're allowed to facilitate that type of kind of semi-anonymous uh, transfers at a premium. Um, it's kind of like having your 21-year-old uh, kid next door, you know, stand outside a, 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 a quickie mart and be able to um, buy legally, and then there'll be a a, a line of kids there getting it from him. So it, it's just not making sense. We gotta do better at KYC. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. One last word. I'd like to bring down my information to you uh, and have you engage me. I know we've run out of time. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Most interesting, well worth my time. Gentlewoman uh, from California, thank you very much. I yield back my time. Gentlemen's time has expired. The gentleman from Guam, Mr. San Nicolas, who is coming to us remotely, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I'd like to echo the sentiments of my um, bipartisan colleagues. I think this is the second uh, subcommittee hearing we're having that I, I think has a lot of uh, bipartisan interest. Madam Chairwoman, thank you so much for your leadership in helping us to come together on very key issues that are affecting the globe. Uh, I wanted to first um, just make sure we have it clear on the record, if we can just get a quick yes or no across the board from the witnesses. But what I'm hearing is that every single person on this panel agrees that the United States needs to, in some form or another, whether it's a, CDB, uh, a CBDC or a stable coin, we need some form of digital currency. Is that a yes across the board? Uh, I think he's asking for a yes or no across, so we'll start with Ms. Chin and just move to the right. Uh, yes. Yes. Yes for CBDC. Yes. Yes. Thank you. And actually, Dr. Norloff, I would like to posit my next question directly to you because, um, and this is kind of tied into, I think, where Mr. Barr was going earlier about the difference between CBDC and stablecoin. Uh, you know, we have the Federal Reserve, and they're responsible for um, monetary supply and, and a various host of other responsibilities in the financial system. We also have U.S. Treasury, and, their, and one of their primary responsibilities is the production of coin and currency. 
as we navigate going forward, what we look, what we see is a unanimous need for us to adopt some form of digital currency. Where should the leadership really come from? Should the leadership come from the Federal Reserve or come from U.S. Treasury that has a responsibility to produce coin and currency? Uh, Dr. Norloff. Uh, I think that the uh, leadership should come from the Federal Reserve. I also want to say that um, for the CBDC, I think that um, uh, progress in this area um, is uh, especially important because that is really where China um, can make a difference to undercut the, uh, the, the dominance of the dollar. Uh, if the CBDC, the Chinese CBDC, uh, goes forward, uh, we will see uh, a very strong push towards a convertible uh, renminbi, which will put the uh, Chinese currency uh, really uh, make it much more attractive for international investors. Um, I would also like to highlight that for the CBDC, it's not just a China issue, it's, it's a general issue. I mean, according to the Atlantic Council's research, there are about 104 countries that are currently exploring CBDCs. Um, and I think that there are real opportunities for the Federal Reserve to assume leadership in this critical area. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to, I guess, posit the question across the board because I'm, I'm still trying to come to um, grips with the idea that um, you know what has historically been a treasury responsibility on the production of coin and currency will now um, potentially become also a Federal Reserve power um, if they are authorized to do so on the digital currency sphere. And so I'd like to also posit to um, the remaining um, panelists. Is there a consensus that they, there's a belief that the Federal Reserve should be the one taking the lead on the, the digitization of a U.S. currency, or should it be the Treasury? I guess we can go from right to left. Mr. Levin, that would be you. I guess we're going the other way this time. Oh, okay. Um, uh, thank you, sir. I think that the, uh, the question of oversight here is about uh, primarily technology, and, and I would say that one clarification that I would like to sort of put forward is that actually we already have a lot of digital dollars in existence. In fact, a lot of our payment system is digital. We're not sort of sitting here with uh, dollar bills. And so, you know, that system is primarily, you know, the Federal Reserve is primarily responsible for the technology that supports how we clear and settle those dollars. And so, you know, it does make sense that you know, as a pure technology play, that we think about what the future of that technology stack looks like, and that would come under the Federal Reserve. And there are some significant work in making sure that all of the institutions that are actually transacting in dollars and have access to that system, uh, that they actually can, you know, have buy-in and weigh in on the cybersecurity concerns and the AML concerns. I agree with Mr. Levin in that it really depends on the technology itself. Um, if we're talking purely about a CBDC, a central bank issued digital dollar, um, then certainly obviously the Federal Reserve, is that, that's the function that the Federal Reserve has always um, taken when it comes to our currency. Um, but when we're talking about U.S.-backed stable coins um, globally, uh, you know, for payments, that, that could very well be something that is regulated or uh, the oversight comes from the Treasury Department. Just like other sort of technology, whether you're talking about securities or commodities, could be, could be handled by other regulators. So I think today, um, it really depends on the technology. But to the first question, um, the, US, uh, the, the U.S. doubling down on the need for, for, for a digital asset that, that holds our values uh, and exports those values, whether it's a stable coin or a CBDC, I think it's certainly important. Gentlemen's time has expired. The gentleman expired. from Texas, Mr. Williams, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank all of you for uh, calling this hearing today. Being from Texas, uh, when I hear about payment systems funding illegal activities, my mind, you know where it goes. It goes to the southern border. Uh, this year alone, we have seen the numbers expecting to see over 2 million people illegally come into this country. Pretty unbelievable. And this massive influx of people has created a booming industry for drug cartels and human trafficking organizations. Now, it's amazing how much these criminal enterprises have grown over the last few years. Just in 2018, uh, there was an estimated $500 million in illicit uh, revenues along the border. This year, that number has grown to $13 billion. And I've been to the border, I've been going to the border many, many, for many years. 
and witness firsthand how chaotic the situation is for the brave men and women on the Border Patrol. We need to pray for them every single day. The Biden administration needs to stop turning a blind eye to the disaster. Harris and President Biden have not even been down there and get serious about ending this national problem that we've got. When I talk with Border Patrol agents, they say traditionally cash is king for these criminal organizations. So however, with the advent of cryptocurrencies, there is some concern that the ease of cross-border payments has outfueled this rise in revenue. So Mr. Levin, can you describe the scale that cash is used for illegal activities compared to cryptocurrencies? And additionally, uh, can you give us a recommendation on how we can better implement technology to track the illicit money flows? Thank you. Thank you, sir, for the question. It, it is a very important issue. The, the feature of cryptocurrencies is that it does work seamlessly across borders anywhere in the world instantaneously, the same way as the internet. And so, you know, people think that, you know, that represents real problems when it comes to, um, you know, the issues that you're talking about. However, I would say that, you know, in, in networks, in my experience, where it comes down to drug trafficking, human trafficking, um, and criminal activity, you know, there are very established means of moving money, uh, and those networks tend to rely you know, heavily on existing financial networks of money laundering, which are very cash dependent still today. Um, you know, when it comes to you know, being able to track this more <coughs> proactively, you know, it is actually possible to look at you know, the flows of funds that go between borders when it comes to cryptocurrencies. That, that is what Chainalysis does and provides you know, that type of intelligence to you know, the agencies that are responsible for tracking down you know, the illicit use of cryptocurrencies, drug trafficking, and human trafficking that can be tied back to specific instances. And indeed, you know, I've, I've been sort of you know, familiar with several investigations where uh, cryptocurrencies have actually led to the discovery of these types of networks and the arrests of the people who are perpetrating these crimes. So, uh, thank you for that. So, we, we've seen a news report for several months that the Biden administration is trying to revive some form of the Iran nuclear deal. And unfortunately, the president has been keeping Congress in the dark about how these negotiations are progressing, and which is extremely bothering to me and a lot of others considering this country is still a state sponsor of terrorism. So uh, uh, just this week, the OFAC took actions against 10 Iranian individuals and multiple businesses for their role in various ransomware attacks. So again, Mr. Levin, can you describe the methods that Iran is using to commit these cyber crimes? Thank you, sir. Yeah, and it's a very important and timely issue. So um, according to OFAC, uh, the IRGC affiliated group is uh, perpetrating cybercrime attacks using known vulnerabilities um, and uh, gaining unauthorized computer access to devices to extort victims in order to unlock those computers. Um, what's then possible it, due to the transparent nature of cryptocurrency is that OFAC can, uh, with their partners in uh, other law enforcement agencies, can actually track and trace those funds and manage to actually list some of the addresses that were being used to extort um, you know, their victims, which definitely puts a dent in the financial motivations, um, if there were some, uh, to perpetrate those attacks. Um, and so you know, what I've seen historically is that we are actually able to track down some of the networks that enabled the ransomware and cybercrime actors within Ar Iran um, that are causing a disruption to our healthcare system, our education system, and targeting US businesses. And with the right tools, those agencies can go after them and prevent them from financially benefiting. Gentleman yields. The gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Auchincloss, who is also the vice chair of the full committee, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Ms. Jin, my question is for you to begin with on China's digital currency. In January, you published research entitled China's Digital Currency, Adding Financial Data to Digital Authoritarianism. The article states that, quote, the Chinese government hopes to leverage digital currency slash electronic payment, or DCEP, for the Chinese Communist Party's domestic political agenda, end quote. This furthers the belief that the CCP's digital currency will have to be taken up at the expense of privacy and individual freedoms. Uh, I want to add my voice to uh, 
what we've heard from the Republican side of the aisle, that to contest China's uptake of a CBDC, we do not need to respond with our own CBDC, but rather with a regulated competitive marketplace of stable coins to let American entrepreneurialism and competition uh, surface the best. Uh, I welcome your input on that, uh, both how the United States might create that ecosystem um, and also how it might help us compete with the Chinese digital dollar, or digital yuan, excuse me. Thank you so much for your question. Uh, I'm, to answer it, uh, I might offer a heuristic that I use when I think about the Chinese system and the American system, which is this concept of legibility. So it's legibility, it's kind of a old political science terms that talks about uh, using simplistic metrics to understand the populace or the citizenry that you're serving. So it's coming from the state, uh, the perspective of the state. And we can clearly see in the way that China uh, runs its ECNY or DCEP, it has, it has many names, um, that the idea is to have an enhanced sense of state-run digital legibility. Uh, the idea is to collect as much data as it can on a citizenry and the data might over time have predictive uh, property as well, depending on the advanced nature of uh, the PBOC's big data analytic um, skill set. Uh, but this has proven to be a very useful way for me personally to think about how the United States and China systems are different. And uh, on the other side of digital legibility, it's this respect for digital financial privacy, which is how, uh, I would say, the crux of how the U.S. innovation system works, um, how the U.S. financial technology innovation systems and economic actors work together. So uh, I personally envision, just according to my research, uh, it's the United States uh, innovation system will be a lot more uh, productive if the regulations, first of all, are clear, but second, uh, the government is not uh, cracking down or limiting certain innovative actors uh, in essentially doing their jobs or conducting their businesses. So um, to, to jump in there, and we're making yeah. progress on, on right. bipartisan stablecoin legislation, right. which is encouraging. Um, do you think it's necessary, just to, just to really burrow down into this point, for there to be a US CBDC for us to outcompete what the Chinese Communist Party is, is trying to do by creating an alternative financial payment system and digital currency? Uh, I don't think it's a necessary condition. However, I do think there's a lot of effort inside the US government from many different branches uh, considering uh, the possibility for- So R&D, fine, could, could help us set the table and, and enforce right. international norms, but not actually the production of- Not actually okay. the production, uh, does, but- Does anybody one... on this panel want to disagree with that? I have a point to this. I, I, I think that a lot of the focus here is on digital currencies, and I think that it's an, it, it, it is important. Um, but, I, but I also think that the, the United States today is, is not really competing with, with China. I mean, China is trying to catch up, and they are using various methods in order to catch up. And so the United States does not have to have a central bank digital currency at this point, it could become more interesting at some point, at some future point in time. Um, for the Chinese, however, it is quite crucial to have a central bank digital currency in order to get where anywhere close where the, to where the United States is today. So, because so, Dr. Norloff, you, you've written about this, I know, in the Washington Post about dollar dominance mm -hmm. and the Chinese trying to catch up. And are you, you're, you're saying now that we don't need a CBDC to persist dollar dominance? China is, if we're looking you know, at the role of the dollar in the international system, China is nowhere near the United States. Yes. Uh, China is trying to find inroads and various avenues in order to compete with the United States, but it's coming from a very, very low uh, floor. And could a well-regulated stable coin marketplace in the United States help us box the CCP out from trying to contest us? Um, I'm not sure that it's necessary. I think that it's, it would be actually more uh, productive to think about um, alternative payment systems more broadly. Like, what are other countries doing in order to bypass the dollar? Um, are they trying to use other currencies, notably the Chinese currency, but also, um, I don't know, like the Indian uh, rupee? Or Brazil. Um, the, uh, the, uh, Professor, I need yes. to unfortunately interject Sorry. because I'm, yeah. I'm out of time and I'll yeah. yield back to the chair. Gentlemen, time has expired. The gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Hill, is now recognized for five minutes. 
Thank you, Chairman Himes. Uh, thank you for the panel for sharing your views with uh, the committee today. Thank you, uh, Chair Waters, for convening this hearing. And, you know, let me say that <clears throat> first, uh, Chairman Himes and I have a bill, the 21st Century Dollar Act, which essentially asks the uh, Treasury to do the study that outlines exactly this debate, which is what are the conditions precedent that we have to do in this country to make sure that the dollar remains the reserve currency of the world and is an effective medium of exchange across the, uh, the world. And that's important because uh, right now it's a, it's a major advantage to have things denominated in dollars and we want to maintain that. And part of that would be looking at what role tokenization of the dollar might play and what might uh, role. But uh, Professor uh, Norfolk, uh, is the Chinese RMB ex freely exchangeable? No, um, it, it, no, it, not, not asking you, you. Just is it? Yes, is it? No, no. Uh, do they have the rule of law in China where you'd want to be in a Chinese court adjudicating a claim? Would that be your perfect no. place? No. No, and so no rule of law, no freely exchangeable. This the Chinese RMB is not is not a competing currency unless we make it one by increasing its basket in the SDR basket at the IMF or. Uh, doing anything that diminishes the power of the United States to have that valuable dollar. And I would say running huge budget deficits uh, and racking up debt and spending money like drunken sailors puts the dollar far more at risk uh, than this uh, debate about digital uh, currency. But I urge our bill to be marked up and passed into law so that we can have a definitive all-of-government review of how we maintain a 21st century competitive U.S. dollar. Um, let me turn to the actual subject of the hearing, if I could, and talk about uh, sanctions-related issues and alternative payment systems. And again, let me commend you for the hearing to the majority. Um, since 2014, Russia's attempted to uh, diversify away from the dollar. We've seen that. They've bought the euro. They've bought the yen. They bought the RMB in their central bank. They have fewer dollars. Uh, when we cut them off in 2014, they decided they'd start their own domestic a credit card company, be less dependent on Visa MasterCard. So um, how has uh, Visa and MasterCard suspension of services in Russia affected domestic issuance and acceptance of mirror cards? Who wants to answer that? Yes, sir. So I don't have the exact numbers, but uh, mirror is still... Uh, you know, a shadow of what uh, Visa and MasterCard had in the country. Um, and what's interesting uh, in post-2014, post-Crimea, is, is the way they di diversified. Uh, in fact, in uh, 2014, I was at The Hague on behalf of the DEA talking and, and on this topic, actually, and the uh, FSB was there. They still had two parts, um, uh, anti-child... Uh, uh, sex rings, et cetera. They, they were still working with us on that and uh, anti-drug. Um, and they talked about how, at that time, um, that uh, the Russian web money system, um, which is now in over 80 countries, um, was the quote-unquote primary drug money movement mechanism globally for Russian organized crime. Within a year, it had become their PayPal. Yeah, and uh, you know now we've got uh, Yandex money and uh, various others, Kiwi, um, that are uh, found around the world. These these alternative payment systems have also then become banks. There's like Kiwi Bank. Let me, let me interrupt you yeah. there. Uh, have the secondary sanctions? Has, has China complied with the secondary sanctions in your view to prevent Union Pay from being a global? interchange uh, for those mirror cards, so th to replace the interchange that they were getting internationally from Visa, MasterCard, and American Express? Well, ju judging by the uh, Russians that are going into Finland to use their uh, union pay cards for at ATMs, um, it doesn't necessarily appear so. So that's an area that we should talk to Treasury about vis-a-vis uh, -vis secondary sanctions and, and from a compliance point of view? Correct, and I also think it, it, it speaks to what um, you know, the last two speakers have, have described, which is the CBDC. It, China, Russia, the BRIC countries need that, one of them to have a big system, much more than we need to have a CBDC. Right? They need a way to do trade amongst themselves. 
they have these messaging systems that they can use, the, the big alternative payment systems. I mean, my go goodness, Alipay and WePay are just huge, much bigger than all the crypto times four. Right. Right, those systems exist in secure messaging. So using all of those, if you went then and converted it or combined a, uh, uh, a CBDC, the ECNY, with the mobile payment systems and all the platforms on phones that people have, you'd have a very robust system Thank pretty you. quickly. Thank you. I appreciate it. If you have more, please respond uh, in writing. And I think this really speaks, Mr. Chairman, for why secondary sanctions and the use of FinCEN is important because it, uh, it links all this together in enforcing our sanctions. Yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Davidson, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman. And uh, I thank uh, the, the witnesses for your work in this space. Uh, Chairwoman, thank you for hosting this hearing and paying a lot of attention to this space. I think the future of money is perhaps the most important policy debate going on in Western civilization. Uh, you know, Professor Norloff, as you highlight, uh, there are over 100 countries around the world studying central bank digital currencies. My concern is that of, of the countries studying it, I, I'm not aware of a single country that's studying a distributed, true distributed ledger uh, system that facilitates permissionless peer-to-peer -peer transactions. It seems like everyone's tripping over themselves to find a way to develop a tool that's the same creepy surveillance state system that China's developing. Centrally managed, centrally controlled, central bank digital currency uh, that creates a monopoly on money, essentially to turn it into a tool for coercion and control more than what money is supposed to be, which is a store of value and an efficient means of exchange. So this is a corruption of the whole concept of money. And that's why I think that uh, the future of money is so important to Western civilization. If, if we see money turned into this, uh, the principles and values that have built uh, Western civilization are truly threatened. Uh, it might not be this government, but some government will eventually use that power the wrong way. And for people that doubt that, just imagine whoever your political rival is, having control of the system of money. I've been a little concerned as I watched the debate um, as to the role uh, for Treasury versus the Federal Reserve. Uh, it was a, a good question by Mr. San Nicholas, and I just point out that looking at our money, um, the Secretary of the Treasury signature's on it, not the Chairman of the Federal Reserve. Um, and looking at our money, it says this note is legal tender for all debts public and private and cash is actually the only current truly permissionless peer-to-peer -peer transaction system. Uh, there are a lot of digital systems that are working to rival that. And I would just ask quickly so we can continue the conversation, um, maybe starting from uh, you know right to left, we'll go Mr. Levin. Um, do permissionless peer-to-peer -peer transactions pose a, a threat to the financial system? Uh, thank you, sir, for the, the important question. I think that the permissionless uh, peer-to-peer -peer transfer is you know, part of the way that the economy works. And we have to, we have to find ways where you know, our payment system actually reflects the type of you know, innovation and industrial revolution that we have. Yeah, it's a recognition of fact. Does it pose a risk, Mr. Mr. Redboard? I'm so sorry. I, um, I, I think that it is a major part of, of the financial system moving forward permissionless blockchains, peer-to-peer -peer transactions, and we can now enable that with technology. And I, and I do think at the end of the day, um, you know, the choice of, of what the reserve currency is not gonna be governments, it's going to be entrepreneurs and people who are transacting in that world. And they are always going to choose um, the freedom to transact without surveillance and potential state espionage. So I believe that ultimately entrepreneurs will make the choice for a, for a more permissionless system, and, and the technology will allow for that. Yeah, thanks for recognizing that. And I think it's an important observation. And I think governments are trying to cling to the power um, uh, fundamentally, which decreases trust. I mean, and I think Mr. Hill highlighted why no one's going to adopt a, you know, outside of China, people aren't going to rush to adopt a Chinese, because it's the creepiest surveillance tool developed. Uh, they want to link it to a social credit system. And frankly, there are Western governments that are tripping over themselves to find ways to do the same thing. Uh, I think people should be alarmed that the Bank of International Settlement, the central banker to the central banks, is trying to develop protocols that are this creepy surveillance state version 
what we should be studying, and we can't get uh, the language uh, adopted yet, um, would be, uh, if we are gonna study this with central banks, it would be, how do you do a true distributed ledger, permissionless peer-to-peer -peer system if you are gonna digitize money for your own currency? Uh, right now, the dollar is the dominant currency and likely will be for the foreseeable future, but the nature of that, uh, how that's moved, people care about what does it translate to in dollars, even the most ubiquitous forms um, uh, of uh, central bank digital currency. And I'd say just one last observation, uh, Mr. Redboard, on, on your uh, comments. One is, if you kill the use cases for permissionless peer-to-peer -tran peer -peer transactions because of your uh, desire to corrupt money and turn it into a tool for control, uh, you kill the use cases for all kinds of things that aren't meant to be payment systems. And so I think it's an important thing that we protect that permissionless peer-to-peer -peer, uh, transaction system in, in all the ways that we talk about uh, how to address our payment systems in, in the economy. I wish we had longer. Thanks for having the hearing and thanks for your expertise. Would love to continue the dialogue with every one of you. And I yield back. So almost time has expired. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Gonzalez, who's coming to us remotely, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you for holding this hearing, important hearing. Uh, thank you to our witnesses for, for your insights. Um, Mr. Redboard, I'm going to start with you. Uh, there are some who believe that absent a U.S. CBDC, we won't be able to implement sanctions or administer effective foreign policy. Uh, my contention is private stable coins, provided those coins are dollar denominated and reserves are denominated in U.S. dollars, allow for sanctions to continue. Uh, where do you land on this specific question around the ability to conduct sanctions and foreign policy in a world of uh, dollar-backed stable coins versus uh, CBDC? Th thank you so much for the question. Um, look, I think there are two parts to this. I think first, you have punitive sanctions measures, and we've seen those taken in the sort of in the blockchain-based, private blockchain-based um, world. We've seen OFAC go after non-compliant exchanges, um, Russia-based, um, and essentially shut down their ability to move funds, ransomware payments, um, uh, sanctions evasion. We've seen, as, as, as uh, Mr. Levin and I both mentioned, um, that go after Lazarus Group, um, North Korea's cyber criminals, through, through the use of sanctions. So I think we've seen effective sanctions taken by OFAC in the private blockchain space already. And then I think the second piece of that is to really ensure that we're harnessing the power of sort of, you know, the entrepreneurial spirit in the United States to build a better mousetrap. And that's really where the sort of the, the importance of this committee and, and this institution come in to really ensure that, um, that we're fostering innovation, that we're encouraging people to build. And, and, and as, as I mentioned in the opening statement, we're seeing today that 99% of stable coins are, are uh, or, or stable coins that are fiat backed are tied to the US dollar. And that means already today that we're ensuring that people who transact globally in this new digital system are transacting U.S. dollars, which really maintains the efficacy of U.S. sanctions even in this new digital world where we keep hearing about the ability to move outside of the U.S. financial system. Thank you. I, I could not agree more uh, with that sentiment. Um, I, I want to shift now towards Tornado Cash, uh, which admittedly I'm, I'm still trying to wrap my head around fully. Now, they were recently sanctioned by the Biden administration on the logic that Tornado Cash uh, is primarily a tool used by money launderers. And the, I think the implication is twofold. One, uh, that the technology, if you're sort of the administration, they would say the, the technology is in, inherently evil and used for evil purposes. That's sort of one contention. And the second is that once funds enter Tornado Cash, law enforcement becomes impossible or highly unlikely. Uh, I want to take the second part first. Is it possible to still conduct law enforcement oversight sanctions once funds enter a mixer like Tornado Cash? Uh, I can take this, uh, uh, Congressman. So um, it, is actually, it is actually possible to follow funds through mixing services. Uh, and I know that sounds uh, counterintuitive, but in the case of... Um, in the case of uh, the Ronin Bridge hack, um, we have just demonstrated that it is actually possible to uh, seize funds on the other side of a mixing service. And so um, it is actually, you know, it's not always possible, it is not always impossible, um, but it is actually, um, you know, a technology that um, Chainalysis has developed is in order to be able to help law enforcement actually conduct those investigations. 
if, if I might you. just add and to on that. The, you know. On the first point, uh, real quickly, on the first question, because I'm running out of time, what legitimate uses might one have for using a mixing service? And I'm, I'm thinking specifically about something like getting cryptocurrencies to Ukraine, but um, I don't want to preload that. But sure, I, I sure. That's, that. that's a great that's a great example, Congressman. But also, look, you know, in, in a world in which transactions are opening, happening more and more on open blockchains, people are going to want a level of privacy. Um, we see that people's cryptocurrency addresses have been made public through social media and other places. They're going to want to be able to transact with some level of privacy in those transactions. Um, we see employers who may start paying in cryptocurrency who know the, the various wallets they're sending funds into. Those people will want some level of privacy. You may want uh, privacy from potential state surveillance. Um, but the reality is I think the key to sort of the, the, the question around Tornado Cash is A, I thought Jonathan said it very well in terms of the new capabilities of tools like TRM and Chainalysis to trace through mixers. Uh, but also, it's, it's also so important uh, to ensure that regular users are not affected by these sanctions. So on the one hand, I think regulators are focused on going after illicit actors who are using these types of services, but on the other hand, assure, ensure that regular users uh, are not being affected. And I think that the, the key to that is having great data to really, really understand sort of what wallet addresses you're transacting with. Thank you. Privacy is a core American value. Let's not make it de facto illegal. And with that, I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. It would appear that we have uh, exhausted uh, members with questions. Um, is that correct? Okay. Um, so I'd like to thank our witnesses for their testimony today. This was a, a terrific uh, conversation as evidenced by the fact that every single member went over their time. I think uh, there's, there remains a great deal of interest um, uh, in following up on a lot of this, and we will we will certainly do that, including on some topics that we, uh, obviously the chairwoman has uh, uh, released a, some draft stablecoin legislation, which will be uh, fodder for a lot of consideration and thought. And I think uh, there was also a desire, as you sensed, um, to, to look deeper into uh, what, if any, CBDC would make sense and what's the path there if there is one. So um, I, again, I'd like to thank all of our witnesses for their testimony. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. I ask our witnesses to please respond as promptly as you are able. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit extraneous materials to the chair for inclusion in the record. And I remind members that written questions Materials for the record should be submitted to the email address provided to your offices. With that, I thank our witnesses one more time, and this hearing is adjourned.